Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of The Discourse. My name is Brendan Lotz and seeing as it's a new year, well, I mean, it's February, but we're still in the 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 early stages of 2024 we thought for this edition of the discourse we would bring together some some experts to discuss what is happening in the world what some of the trends we can expect in business going through 2024 uh, and also potentially just a little bit of a look back and see how how things have evolved in this decade the beginning of the decade which started off rather rather tumultuously uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns, which basically changed the face of business for a good few years. And we want to see how things have changed, how how permanent that change is, and how business is evolving in this new era. So joining us today, we have three guests from Veeam, Zero, and Salesforce. Uh, I'm going to start with Veeam. Uh, Michael Cade, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do at Veeam. Yeah, hey everyone. So um, yeah, Michael Cade, and I'm a global field CTO. My my focus over the last three years has been around all things cloud and cloud native technologies. But as we're probably going to definitely discuss around all things data security, data management, data protection, all lands on on me as well within that. And a lot of my focus is speaking to our customers, getting that feedback, feeding that into our R and D and and dev teams so that we're making the right choices to protect that data when bad things happen. Again, something that we'll no doubt get into later on. Fantastic. Then from Zero, we have Colin Timmis. Good afternoon, Colin. Hey, Brendan. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Colin Timmis. I'm the country manager for Zero here in South Africa. Um, I ran an accounting firm for 12 years. I've recovered from being an accountant and I'm now in business, <laughs> which I'm quite proud of. Uh, we support accountants in the accounting industry uh, we help accountants not just use uh, cloud-based and digital software to make things more efficient and give them better insights, but also to change their business model um, and, and how they operate and how they service small businesses. And then, of course, we also help small businesses drive operational efficiencies and, and use cloud-based products like Xero to collect payments quicker, get greater insights into their data, and then, of course, in the background, have their accountants doing all the compliance work uh, far more efficiently. So we're passionate about accountants, passionate about small business and um, what the relationship between those two can do to change the economy in our, in, uh, our country. Fantastic. And then finally, from Salesforce, we have Linda Saunders. Good afternoon, Linda. Hi, Brennan, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat and have a conversation today. So. Yeah, I uh, look after solution engineering uh, for the African continent for Salesforce. And Salesforce is the leading CRM uh, provider in the world. And really, on a very simple level, my team is responsible to be creative around people's business problems, uh, solve those problems with technology. And so I think a uh, really nicely placed to have a really deep discussion with uh, ourselves today. Thank you. Fantastic. So. As I mentioned, we have uh, come out of a rather tumultuous start to the decade. Um, and one of the big questions that is kind of circling around business owners, whether they are huge enterprises or just a small uh, a small team, uh, is about the future of the workplace. Uh, and I wanted to find out, starting with you, Linda, um, how much has Salesforce seen the workplace change? Is are we still in an era where folks are demanding that they have remote work or are businesses moving towards a more hybrid nature or is it everybody back into the office? What sort of trends are we seeing in that in that respect so far? Yeah, Brendan, I mean, a contentious issue to kick off, right? But uh, I think uh, what I've certainly seen is from a, from a personal perspective, I, I mean, I work in Salesforce. We've been super successful in terms of applying a hybrid approach. Um, but I think we've done that because we've really thought long and hard about the needs of our individual employees and then brought the business imperatives to that conversation and been really consultative about it. Um, but I do feel if we kind of apply this top-down dictatorial approach, um, I'm pretty sure that businesses are going to start seeing that they're really going to struggle to attract and retain talent. And that's certainly true in the more digital sectors. Fantastic. Uh, Colin, from your side, are, are you guys at zero? Are you kind of embracing a hybrid work situation or are, are you back in the office? 
Uh, yeah, so we have different policies um, in different countries ar around the around the world. Um, here in South Africa, we have a, a hybrid approach, and we're in the office three days a week, um, at home two days a week. Um, we're at a different stage of growth in our business compared to some other countries, and so building culture and team is is quite important for us. And we also want to take into account the fact that some of our team don't have um, great environments at home that they can work from, uh, whether that's their setup, um, you know, or the um, the the space that they work in or, or, or people that live in, in the home with them. Um, amongst our customers, we have some partners um, and business owners who are fully remote. We have some who are fully in office. Um, and so uh, there, 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 there definitely is, as was, as was mentioned, it is a bit of a contentious subject, but there are different opinions. And I think as a company, you just got to find what works best for you and your team and um, the stage of growth that you're at, um, the way your team is set up. Um, and just got to be conscious of doing the best thing for your business and your team um, at the same time. So I just want to unpack there a little bit, uh, Colin, regarding yeah. your comments about culture. Um, yeah. it's, we recently did a bit of a debate amongst ourselves uh, on one of our podcasts about hybrid work versus in office. And one of the points we brought up was how difficult it is to kind of convey company culture through a sort of hybrid or remote remote working thing how, how do you get that right and what sort of what sort of things do you do to help build that culture um maybe to take, take a step back um before we built our team in south africa it was only myself and one other employee and we were connected directly with our global counterparts in australia new zealand uh, the us and the uk and then we found that we were able to just as two individuals become part of that culture even though we were fully remote um you know it permeated the way people behave and um and, and treat one another. And it's, it's really reflected in how serious a company takes its values mm. and not just, you know, diagrams and pictures that are stuck up on a wall, but whether people really believe it. And unfortunately, uh, you know, zero is just a fantastic place to work and, and we really, really are, you know, um, quite passionate about our values and doing it remotely um, didn't really hinder that, um, that process. Um, I always felt a part of the business. I always felt that I learned a lot. I learned, um, probably how to work differently, how to think differently, how to treat people differently. And it was really, really valuable for me. It's probably one of the reasons why I continue to work at Zero is just the, the focus on values and um, how important that is to the business. Having said that, when we started building our team out, um, you know, we did, we did have some members that were remote, but, but we also felt the need to just connect more in person, which was less about culture and values and more just about relationships um, yeah. and being more efficient in how we work. So I think there's a distinction between those two. I don't necessarily think you have to be you know, in office to drive culture and values. I think um, a lot of that is enforced by relationships and how you work together and treat one another. And we just found for the stage of growth that we were at that, you know, getting together and having meetings in person rather than having meetings online when we could was uh, less taxing. And I think there's research that shows that on online meetings are you know, far more tiring and exhausting than meeting in person. Yeah. Um, and we just got, we got two solutions quicker. Uh, we were able to work more efficiently. Um, and so it, 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 it again, it's, it's, it's such a difficult balance. Um, I think the danger is in, um, you know, dictating, one policy without discussing it and taking into account the nuances of your company. So what I'm picking up so far is that it, it's all just about communication, really. Um, Michael, moving it to you, I, I'm curious to know how a cybersecurity company approaches the world of work and the workplace in, in this era of hybrid work. What, what sort of what sort of trends are you seeing within Veeam itself as regards workplaces? And then in terms of this broader cybersecurity landscape, are, are companies embracing it as well as the security measures needed to ensure that their perimeters are kind of locked down? Yeah, I think that's a, there's, that's a big question as well, right? Um, I, think, I think to begin with, the whole remote hybrid type mentality of working from home or not necessarily having to be in the office for every day of the week, just really smash down those, the four walls of the data center. When you were all in the office or when everyone was in the office, it was a lot easier to contain that data. Mm. You didn't have your home internet that was now like on the edge. We're, there's a lot of facets of where our data is now as a business as to where we need to then consider security models and how do we protect that data? How do we educate? 
not necessarily the people in tech, but it's the the all the other elements of the business as well that are also working from home. And how do we make sure that that's that data is also secure? But equally, when we make a mistake, what's the what's the process around recovering that workload as well? Mm. And uh, one of the, I did an article and a, and a podcast back in during the pandemic where we really saw this 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 I guess revolution of the the hybrid working. I'm ever so lucky in that the last 10, 15 years of my career has been remote work, and I've I've worked from my home. Um, you do feel that you sometimes that you are detached from the business and not have not being able to have those conversations. I think as we've seen over the the pandemic, things like Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, all of the various different meeting applications that we have have made that uh, experience a little bit better. But nothing beats being face to face, eyeball to eyeball type mm. type uh, building that that relationship. But I think. Where, when we look at that that data, we've made we've made difficult choices around where we store that data, how we access that data, and even more so now, it's not just a, a case of oh, I've got my virtual environment in my data center, I've got my physical workload, and that's where my email lives, that's where my CRM systems live, like to Linda and Salesforce. I imagine that there was a huge, huge uptick. There's already a big uptick of people using Salesforce as their CRM um, system anyway, but that whole smashing down the four walls of the data center really erupted people to use those SaaS-based services to to drive that. And, and then we have to think about, well, how do we protect that data? How do we help our customers protect that data? So I think there's a there's a few things that we could definitely go deeper in, but I think it, the important part is is about customers don't all or customers businesses don't necessarily always understand what they need to do and what they need to understand i think we're still in that when it comes to cybersecurity is about it's not going to happen to me mm. um we're in that phase where where actually it's a it's a it's a case of well no when is it going to happen not not if it's going to happen it i the the stats over the last five, six plus years have, have just really accelerated that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when and how do you then resolve that or how can you put up better and bigger barriers around all of this data in all of these disparate locations as well? Yeah, I mean, so we've recently been covering a lot of news around data centers and cloud services, uh, especially in South Africa. And there was recently a report that came out that pegged uh, Johannesburg as or South Africa, rather, as one of the biggest data center markets in the Southern Hemisphere. So to, to you, Colin, I kind of want to kind of want to pick your brain here, but about how the uptake of cloud-based services and just software as a service in general has been in South Africa, uh, especially among smaller businesses, smaller businesses, which you mentioned earlier. Are we seeing smaller businesses in South Africa starting to embrace cloud blade? No, oh, sorry, cloud-based platforms a bit more? Yeah, um, look, I, I, th I think it's different across different um, verticals. Um, you know, I, I was talking to someone earlier today, and I don't think you can go to a market or, or any uh, even informal business and not see them with a, a, a payment service um, you know, attached to their phone that then connects to um, their inventory system, which is probably a, a SaaS product. Um and I think what we're seeing amongst our customers is is far more are adopting SaaS products to drive operational efficiencies um, straight from their mobile device. Um, the difficulty comes in selecting the right products and understanding what's clutter because you're moving from an environment where you haven't had any choice and now you've got a thousand apps to choose from. And so there's a great deal of education and enablement that's needed to help people understand um, what's going to ultimately help their business uh, become more operationally efficient, but also scale and grow. Um, and so we see, you know, in our app store as an example, we have over a thousand uh, SaaS apps connected to our product. And uh, one of the benefits we talk to people about is that, is that exactly that ability to adopt a SaaS product, implement it in your business, um, and then you've got your payment services, your e-commerce services, your finance services, your CRM, 
you know, for a small business, all hooked up together, all with the data flowing um, seamlessly via the APIs that are really built and connected. So there's definitely um, a desire to adopt these products. And we've seen that increase post COVID naturally as, as you would with, with remote work and people not, not being in the office and detached from their customers. And, and even amongst accountants, um, you know, accountants, for many years, there was only you know like one or maybe two pieces of software that you were allowed to use, or, or so we thought. And um, you know there was a massive reluctance to change. But in the last few years, you know we we've seen a lot of that growth and a willingness to experiment also with with SaaS products, uh, whether they're reporting and insights tools or data analytics. Uh, there's just so many. I think the real challenge at the moment for many small businesses is is getting the advice. It's almost becoming quite complex. We need an advisor to help you choose the right apps. Mm. Um, but but people are out there shopping um, and implementing products. Um, they've just got to do so in the right order, I think. And then, Linda, from Salesforce's perspective, how are you guys seeing the markets trending towards uh, SaaS products and cloud-based software as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going to sort of tag on to what Colin's saying. We're certainly seeing a big uptick. Um, and I mean, if I'm, I'm, I'm sort of contextualizing it in terms of the South African businesses, the reality is for many of these businesses, they don't have just South African customers. A South African customer is actually a global customer because we have access to global brands. We have a global brand mindset. And so, you know, we're really having to, to drive the innovation that we're seeing in a global scale. And that's really tough to do when you have a small business. Um, besides the optionality and the challenges around the buying process, which I'll get into a little bit now, but I think it's that having the scale to be innovative, and I think certainly software as a service is providing that scale without the investment of a large IT team and you know all of the stuff that typically we would have seen outside of the SaaS software environment. Um, so then, you know, for us, we really have this imperative around how do we simplify. Uh, this buying process and, and this whole process, particularly for smaller businesses, you know, making the product uh, easy for them to understand and really easy to derive value from. And I think, you know, when, when we designed Salesforce and we thought about it, we didn't just think, well, you need to be a guru and a coder and an et cetera, et cetera, to be able to access and use the software. It's really like, how do we bring drag and drop capability so you can configure the platform and get to value really quickly? And mm -hmm. I think those, those elements sort of coming together have really democratized what typically would be considered to be a real big enterprise kind of product into something that we're even seeing NGOs uh, that are they're adopting wow. Salesforce. So, you know, there's there's really quite surprising is that you would think Salesforce is a really massive brand and that, you know, it's only really enterprise customers. But that's certainly not what we're experiencing in South Africa and on the ground. Is that a result of intentional intentionally trying to diversify your product stack? And how, how does one do that for companies as big as Salesforce? Because, I mean, you it sounds very easy to not just make uh, software for enterprise, uh, but making software that is, is catering to the needs of an enterprise and a small business, I can imagine that's quite tricky. I mean, I think I think for us it was very intentional um, and certainly has become more and more intentional as the product suite develops. Mm. So I think for us what's been sort of the not-so-secret secret sources, our sort of metadata layer. And that sort of metadata layer allows us to add capabilities to the platform um, where everything's speaking the same language. And that's been a game-changer for us in terms of listening to our customers, understanding what is it and where do they want to go in terms of the product evolution, and then allowing us to really scale up and sort of meet those objectives at quite a quick speed. So, you know, we do three releases a year, and those releases are typically driven by our customer demand, as they should be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael, just to uh, kind of elaborate on this a little bit, I, I, I want to get your perspective as regards cybersecurity. I think a lot of um, entrepreneurs, startups, small businesses, uh, just speaking to the fact we said earlier, where a lot of business owners will think that, oh, I'm never going to encounter cybersecurity or breach. Uh, um, but how much should cybersecurity and cybercrime help inform decisions when you are looking at moving towards SaaS and cloud-based applications? Because from my own experience, I've seen a lot of business owners kind of say, well, you know, I, my, my data's with an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft, so they're responsible for it. W what sort of consideration should businesses have when they are, in terms of cybersecurity, when they are looking at 
diving into the SaaS world. Yeah, and I get, uh, cybersecurity is one element of that, but exactly that is that that data, regardless of what SaaS you're using, that's your data. Um, I'm sure Linda will agree on this as well, is that whatever they put into that, their CRM, the Salesforce are going to keep your keep the lights on, keep the infrastructure, keep the service available to them, their customers. But that data, if they make a mistake to it, that's not really on Linda and her team to, to get that back. There, there are options around that as well. We, we work with Salesforce quite closely from a Veeam perspective as well. Um, both as our CRM system, as well as helping our customers that use use that. And I think it comes down to data, like shared responsibility. If you look at AWS's shared responsibility model, there there is a far, there is a line that says that we're going to keep the lights on, we'll keep the service available to you. But from a data point of view that you put in, mm. that responsibility is yours. From a from a backup point of view, from a security point of view. It's very easy if anyone's ever done it. It's very easy to uh, uh, let everyone into your AWS account by sharing keys yeah. and, and doing wrong, bad practice that way. And that AWS aren't going to help you at that point. They're, they're going to keep the infrastructure up and running for you. And you're going to pay the, the, the easy button to <laughs> let them let someone else manage that service. And you're going to consume that. But Ultimately, it's your data. And I think I'm still probably six years I've been talking about the shared responsibility model when it comes to cloud and SaaS-based workloads and the data within it. Um, there's still ways to go on that. And so, so cybersecurity just adds another layer. For me, especially from a breach or a ransomware perspective, that's just another failure scenario, much the same as if we all make mistakes. If we were to make an accidental deletion or a change in our data, then we would need to think about how do we recover that, where do we recover that, et cetera, as well. So there's a there's a much bigger picture outside of just the cybersecurity responsibility. There's a lot of just shared responsibility when you're leveraging a service. Mm. And and just to build off of that, is is that an attitude that you're seeing within uh, within organizations? Are they cognizant of this? Um, yeah. Are they aware that they, the data that's in there is their responsibility? It, 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 don't get me wrong. Based on the last six, seven years of having that conversation, yes, there's a bit more of a, an awareness of that. Mm. But we still go into some environments. To, to your point, you you speak to them, they think, oh, no, my data is in AWS. They've got me covered. I keep picking on AWS. It's all the public clouds. It's all the SaaS-based offerings. There's a shared responsibility that, that all SaaS and cloud vendors will have on their website that, that states that that is your data, uh, mm. is the general, general term. Fantastic. I want to move now towards artificial intelligence and large language models. I think most of 2023 was dominated by artificial intelligence and the likes of ChatGPT, BARD, uh, which is now apparently just Gemini. Um, so I, I kind of want to gauge how biz the business economy is, is embracing uh, artificial intelligence. And I want to kick this to Linda first, uh, because Salesforce has been kind of working with artificial intelligence for a number of years already. So perhaps you could give us some insight into how businesses are using AI and how Salesforce is making use of AI in its business. Yeah, I mean, Brennan, how much time do we have, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, let me put it this way. I think globally for businesses, we're still trying to define what businesses mean when they come to us and say, I want AI. Um, and I think we, we're still working out the narrative around what do we mean when we say AI? Because, you know, if we think about AI, uh, 10 years ago, we launched Einstein um, Predictive AI. Uh, and a lot of businesses don't even realize that they're alive with AI today. Um, in that context, they're using the Salesforce platform and, and they have Einstein and there is predictive mm -hmm. analytics happening. I think definitely we've seen with the large language models and this generative AI trend um, is certainly we've seen a democratization of AI. And I think what, what the, the shift was here is that typically AI was something businesses procured and individuals may or may not be aware of AI running in the background mm -hmm. in terms of the daily work. 
Now, uh, you know, chat GTP, I mean, I don't think I was at a dinner party where someone wasn't asking chat GTP to do something, you know, and that means that we've democratized it. We've put it in the hands of the individuals. And now there's this, this different shift. We're seeing individuals saying to businesses, hey, there's some productivity gains here. I want access. And businesses are looking at this and going, yeah, there are productivity gains, but there's some risk involved in this. And, you know, we need to manage this in a, in a sort of an ethical and smart way in order to still get the benefits, but avoid some of the risks. Um, so that's that's sort of what I'm seeing. I think the second part of, of let's call it the, the AI wave, is certainly with a lot of the discussions I'm having, the proverbial penny is dropping. Um, and it's not dropping on the AI, it's dropping on data. I mean, data is actually the gold mine, um, and it should be treated as an asset. And I think that's a seismic shift in thinking in terms of business strategy. Um, and so it's sort of how do you mine your asset and make sure that nobody else is mining your asset and your data doesn't become someone else's product? And then this sort of tightrope walk of balancing that with that trust and ethical practice. You know, those are the things that I'm really seeing front and center at the boardroom tables in our discussions around AI. And then to Colin, um, how is Zero approaching the AI conversation? Um, I, I gather that thing of generative AI and large language models can be quite useful as regards financial data, or am I mistaken in that regard? Yeah, no, you you spot on. Um, you have a large amounts of financial data um, enable businesses to understand how they're tracking relative to their competitors in the same vertical or the same sector. Um, and so we've got uh, you know a lot of AI and machine learning built out in our tools and products. And as I think Linda mentioned as well, many people have been using elements of AI for a while. They're just not aware of it. Um, and, and so we definitely have a big focus on building out uh, those tools in our product to provide the customer with greater insights and analytics into their data, uh, particularly on the data ingestion side and, and, and how we recognize things like exceptions and perhaps compliance issues in data and surface those up to, to the users, to the accountant or the small business owner in a way that's useful to them. Um, and, and so it definitely is, I, th I think in, in many small business owners' minds, at least, or accountants' minds, there is an, an idea of what AI represents, like that it should be a, you know, like a flying car or, or something really material and, and, and visible that changes your, your life immediately. But I think it's, it's, it's perhaps a bit more subtle and has been coming along, um, you know, for, for a number of years now. And, and it, it almost permeates every part of our product at the moment. Um, and looking at what the potential could be down the line in terms of accounting data and financial data and how lending decisions are made. Uh, we, we, we're seeing that already in alternative lending. Um, you can you know, apply for a loan as a small business owner uh, for, I think, up to 5 million rand and get an answer within a day, mm. um, which is you know, completely the opposite to the traditional lending model. And, and there's elements of, of AI and machine learning in those processes. Um, and so we'll we'll see that we'll see that continue when when business owners are asking questions to understand their cash flow and understand their customer base and their segmentation and their upsell and cross sell opportunities. You know, you, you probably aren't going to be generating reports and 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 running an analysis as you used to be. Now you'll just be asking questions, and the system's going to find the answers for you and surface up those best those best options. So that's already well on its way and already happening and really exciting to see how it's going to transform, particularly the accounting and the finance industry. Yeah. I'm curious to see how artificial intelligence makes its way into like FinTech, the FinTech industry. Um, yes. Because I think that in that instance, it can be hugely beneficial, not just to the founders of these companies, but also to their ultimately their clients. Yeah. Just maybe just the last point. And it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, you know, it's so interesting because the, the, you know all these topics are they're, well, they're really topical at the moment and, and they're really interesting and exciting or what's coming down the line but you know for, for the customers that we serve small businesses and accountants and um, you know we really try and stick to the basics and, and what many people forget is that most people are doing their finances on Excel mm. um, you know or not using their mobile device to capture expenses and claims and, and claims management and so we, we always caution people on these conversations, particularly our type of customers, that you know these advances will come and the changes will come and they'll they'll benefit them in their businesses. But 
you know, let's just make sure that we're doing the basics first because otherwise you won't get access to any of these these new developments. Yeah. So, Michael, to you, um, something that I noticed, or I, there's many parallels that I have drawn myself between uh, the world of uh, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. And one of the things that has me a little bit concerned is companies that are just diving into the artificial intelligence space uh, and uploading their data and keying their data into the, the public-facing version of ChatGPT. What sort of security consideration should a business take before diving into implementing AI into their workflows? Oh, yeah, you've definitely got to have an AI strategy to that because, yeah, to that point is, what, six to nine months ago, we only had access to the big open options like ChatGPT, as an example, or BARD mm-hmm. or whatever that was. And I think there's there were there has been some major, major vendors out there that have leaked IP um, and it's caused well, that upheaval for, for those those companies out there. Um, then at the, towards the back end of 2023, though, we started to see more private GBT type models that, are, that, that you can run yourself on your own, on your own equipment, on your own servers, hit, uh, built away from the public eye, where you could generally be able to use your own secure co-pilot. So anyone familiar with... Visual Studio or, or GitHub and being able to have a code assistant basically next to you instead of doing that alongside GitHub Copilot, for example, which was a public LLM, you could now have one locally and you could benefit from that. And I think we're going to see much more, um, much more of those private models come into our into our world. I think from my perspective as well is is around how important is that data? How have you trained it? Like, it's very easy for us to go and download. I say it very easy. From a technologist's <laughs> point of view, it's very easy yeah. to download the database, the LLM, and start leveraging that on-premises. The um, the key part there is, right, okay, I'm just downloading a, a large language model that I'm going to use. Where that becomes valuable, and this goes to Linda's point, is if we start training that or giving that data that, that model then becomes very potentially very important to us as a business. Mm. And that's where the importance is. And then we're talking to people around how do we protect that? Ultimately, LLMs are generally a database, a vector database, a, a version of a database that we've worked with for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, but then we need to consider how do we protect that? How, what, does, what, does ba- what does a bad day look like if we were to lose that LLM? database mm. and the the hours of compute or storage that we've put into that and yeah how what would the the leveraging of that data look like and what would the recovery of that data look like so from we've got a couple of things from a veeam perspective where we're looking how we could use ai and we've done a couple of things there um within the product to help our customers lives a little bit easier mm. and to be able to leverage their own data but then equally it's about how do we help our customers that are leveraging AI to be able to make sure that we protect them when they're building out their own models and, and creating this large data set that needs some level of protection. So you mentioned that these, uh, uh, Michael, sorry, you, you mentioned that there's this trend now towards companies training their own LLMs with all that data. Um, is that not a, a major security concern or security risk? And like w- we saw earlier this year, the mother of all breaches, it was called, uh, where cyber criminals had just basically collated a whole bunch of data into one massive database and they were selling that online. Um, are we going to see breaches that contain this training data in future? Is is that something that, that could potentially happen? I think that data that we're, that companies are using is already available to that point. So the, the, the Moab, the, the massive of all breaches yeah. type thing that, that you're referring to, um, that data was already around that company, around their environment, around their cloud. And it was in the form of a database anyway. So what we're, what I'm saying, what we're seeing from an LLM perspective is customers taking that production data 
and pushing that into a, the LLM. So okay. it's not like we're creating um, new data. Fair we're enough. just leveraging older data into that LLM, into that training model. Now, where it does get very interesting, and this is why we always have to think about that preventative, that prevention. How do we stop people getting in with things like zero trust? How do we make sure that we are being the most secure we possibly can? Uh, one of the things I talk about is the bang, the bang being something bad, left of bang being the preventative ways in which we stop people getting in, right of bang being the, okay, how do we get out of this mess? What's the remediation look like? But to that is we have to think about, we we have to take advantage of, of the AI, as Colin kind of said, is using this inside their tooling to enable their customers to do more and faster and, get these loan approvals quicker so that the world keeps moving at, at the pace it's going. Because if, if if Colin doesn't do that, then someone else will. So it then comes down to a competitive angle as well. But we also need to be then thinking top of mind, which has always been a very difficult thing for security, for observability, and from, back, from a data protection point of view, is we have to be thinking about what does the prevention look like in terms of that data and how do we protect protect ourselves from that that breach but i don't think that it's potentially the insights that become very valuable mm. because if you can see trends based on that llm and you can ask it questions about what should we do at the end of the month and it gives you that now you're not now it could be well, still a cyber security threat but what about if a competitor now got that data yeah. that would also be a, a an extremely bad bad day at the office as well yeah, corporate espionage. Let's hope that doesn't make a return. Um, I want to move now to energy. Uh, and not just in South Africa, but around the world, we're starting to see um, the energy situation becoming a lot more tenuous. Uh, and I wonder how that is having an effect on business. Um, Linda, maybe you could speak to this, but are you guys seeing uh, any trends as regards energy carbon footprints, carbon responsibility, environmental responsibility, are businesses embracing this and how, how does it impact them to start making these provisions? Perhaps you could speak from a sales force point of view in this regard. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, if we look at it sort of top level down, there's a continuum of thought around this. I think certainly uh, we're seeing a trend in the right direction, which is, you know, as human beings, we're stewards of this planet. And if we hope to survive on it for any extended period of time, we kind of have to start taking a more sort of responsive approach to what we're doing. Um, I think, you know, we, we did, I think two years ago, we launched a, a product that was really centered around helping organizations really take the, the green objective a little further and kind of measure their impact and sort of really approach this from a different perspective. Um, but I, I'm going to say, you know, a lot of this I've seen is is very much a an add-on perspective in the, you know, a lot of businesses approach uh, the sustainability objective around how much of a balance sheet can they basically put towards that. And so, you know, when you're seeing global pressure around financing and all of those things, we see this as an imperative that sort of falls off the radar. And uh, I think, you know, businesses could do a lot more to investigate. There is a lot of solutions technology out there that can really help them drive this narrative and this objective in the right direction. And, uh, you know, we're seeing certainly from large enterprise taking a really responsive and, and measured approach in terms of their business impacts. Um, but certainly we need to see that still trickle down into the sort of small to medium enterprises. Then, Colin, to, to you, um, are you seeing demand from your customer base for software and solutions that kind of help them monitor things like carbon tax um, and corporate social responsibility are, are these things that customers are cognizant of uh, that you guys are potentially eyeing in the future um I, I i probably wouldn't say so um i think there are some products out there already there are some SaaS apps um that um that probably do provide some reporting and some insights i don't think we've seen in the small business community, um, a massive drive towards adopting them. It, that, that's not to say that they don't, you know, take the challenges seriously or deem them as important. But they, I think, there's probably um, because of the small businesses not probably paying as much attention to to company finances and, and insights, and uh, the fact that these apps plug on to that data, 
Um, that's probably one reason why there hasn't been that, that level of adoption, but we haven't seen a massive move amongst small businesses to um, adopt some of these apps and products that are available to to help track, say, carbon footprint and 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 the like. I mean, having said that, we we recently did our Zero Beautiful Business Fund awards and were astounded by the number of applicants we had who were specifically in um, that sort of sector, mm-hmm. um, you know, helping with renewable energies and um, and and we're building products and. Um, uh, you know, sustainable farming and and other initiatives that were really, really innovative, and and really helpful. And and while they weren't actual technologies, they were they're actual businesses being started up um, to help deal with some of those challenges. So I, w- I wouldn't say we've seen a lot of product adoption, but definitely a lot of innovation when it comes to how can we solve some of those problems through. Uh, business solutions. That's great. It's great to see that there are folks out there that are looking to the future and uh, potentially helping other businesses uh, and obviously the planets just just be a little bit kinder. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. Um, the the last thing that I want to chat about is one that's, that's I think it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, if we look at 2024, we have over 90 countries that are having their elections this year. There are several wars that are going on around the world. And I'm curious to know how this, if at all, impacts the world of business. Uh, maybe, Michael, you could you could chat about this from a cybersecurity point of view, um, because a lot of the data that we've seen suggests that uh, places where there are wars and there's there's kind of uh, thing, things aren't great to put it to put it in in nice terms, um, that there's often a propensity for cybersecurity, and I, I feel like there's potential for this to spread to other parts of the world. So, how does does things like massive election years and uh, and sort of conflict around the world. How does that influence the world of business from a cybersecurity standpoint? I think we're definitely going to see a lot more of the targeted cyber attacks across government governments, uh, like federal space, more targeted around those those particular areas. But then, equally to that, to our the consumers, to to everyone else, like to all of us living on the uh, living out in our communities we're going to see that that same disinformation campaigns we're going to see voter manipulation all of the the weird and wonderful trials and tribulations of what election season seems to mean now across the globe whether it's in the western world or any, well anywhere in the world now and i think again it comes down to that one is education around that um and making sure that it's not necessarily the the it team that traditionally were in the basement to to coin the the it crowd tv series um that's now much more important and and should be very much top of of business strategy that we need to make sure that we're we're locking our we're locking our doors at night we're we're keeping things secure we're hygienic with our data we understand what our data is and what it looks like and what our trends are um i don't think that change i think there, there has to be a heightened alert for those companies or organizations that are affiliated to um the election campaigns um to to expect that they are going to be very vulnerable to attacks so they need to raise their awareness within the organization don't be clicking on the 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 the, the email the phishing emails that you get don't be clicking on any potential whatsapp messages etc yeah but equally like just raising that awareness and really it's not a can you just do this once this year and you're aware for the the election this needs to be a continuous learning campaign like everyone needs to be top of mind let's not go into the coffee shop and join onto the internet without any vpn or secure connectivity maybe we think about that from a, a technologist point of view but maybe someone in hr or maybe someone in finance wouldn't necessarily think that way so we need to keep on keep on driving that education is my my uh, but in terms of cybersecurity, we're more advanced if we think about the red and the blue team mm. um the baddies and the goodies everything is more advanced now we're much more much more aware that bad things are happening we're probably even more aware that there's manipulation happening disinformation etc across the world Cybersecurity can't really play too much other than 
give you some insight into what is this information potentially. Mm. Um, and I can see technology over the, the course of the next decade really going into a lot more detail about understanding and, and highlighting what disinformation, fake news type um, manipulation is, is happening. But I don't think it's going to stop the tar targeted cyber attacks. Those targeted cyber attacks that we saw potentially four or five plus years ago for other elections, um, I think they're obviously more advanced and more enhanced to, to cause more damage, whether it's the encryption of data or the extraction or exfiltration of data and then being able to hold them to ransom because they've got a copy of a database. I think these are these are things that we have to be very mindful of um, and really double down on that on that preventative part of the, the cybersecurity um, process. Fantastic. Colin, to you, uh, how does the current economic condition, not just in South Africa, but I suppose the rest of the world, how is that affecting small businesses and how is it influencing how Zero is creating and marketing its products? Are you, are you seeing a lot of pressure being placed on, on small to medium enterprises? Uh, maybe you can provide some insight into how the economy is influencing not yeah. just your business, but their businesses as well. Yeah, sure. Look, um, Let's, let's talk about South Africa to start with. The uh, tax stats came out a couple of weeks ago, and um, I think you'd be interested to hear that 67.1% of all company income tax is paid by just over 400 companies. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So uh, I usually call that stat out just to get people's attention on, this, on, on something that's maybe not spoken about a lot, like the actual outputs of the economy in South Africa. Um, a couple of other numbers, we have around 600,000 um uh, employers and about 440,000 VAT vendors. And so this African operating environment for any small business is, I mean, there's no other word um, other than brutal. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's really difficult. Um, having said that, um, we recently did a global survey um, in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, the US, and strangely, um, South Africa came first out of seven countries uh, on a, on this global well-being uh, report that we generated, um, so they were the happiest um, out of all their counterparts when they were asked these five questions in line with the World Health Organization's um, scores on well-being. And so you've got to ask yourself, like, why is that? Like, why, <laughs> um, like, why would why would we be happier than people living in some other countries? Um, and and it, one of the other questions that was asked was around. Uh, the happiness difference between sort of business owners and employees. And again, South Africa and Singapore were the only two countries where business owners were actually happier or had a better state of mind than their counterparts who were employed. And I mean, that just, as we probably all realize, it's it's the resilience of small business owners and, and people who live in South Africa. Like there's, there might be global conflicts and wars and, and economic pressures, but um, we're used to those on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's not as though there's some cycle coming up where there's additional pressures and, uh, pressure and stresses. Uh, you know, our, our, our business owners and um, contributors to the economy have been living through that for many, many years. And so they are really resilient. And I think they're really well prepared. We've seen it in some other research we've done. I won't share all the data now, but on the state of small businesses where, um, you know, they're generally more optimistic than what they have been for a while. They're generally doing better, uh, performing well, like happy with their companies. Um, and, and again, this is a particular segment of the market that we surveyed, but there's a general sense of positivity and of, um, you know, overall optimism, I think, because that's the state you have to live in um, with, with the trauma that uh, business owners have been through. So, you know, there's a lot of change coming globally um, that, that affects um, South Africa, our economy, um, you know, our exchange rate and the volatility mm. there is something we as a business have, we struggled for um for, for many years before we um, were able to start, you know, billing our customers in RAND. And, and it's, it's still, still an issue, that volatility. But uh, I think there's there, there's so much opportunity. And we're definitely seeing more accountants, more business owners um, doing business in, in Europe, uh, in the US, in Australia. Um, some of our uh, accountants offering services where they're outsourcing, um, you know, to, to those countries, whereas ordinarily people would have gone to the Philippines or to India. For similar services and i do it in south africa i mean cape town the western cape's got some fantastic business process outsourcing initiatives mm. that they're supporting as well um which which are really picking up uh showing some good fruit as well so so yes there's a lot of change like uh, uh, you know 
I think it affects all businesses differently, but uh, in the customers and the business owners and accountants we've surveyed and spoken to, there's definitely you know a sense of optimism and positivity. And as our as our research has shown across the globe, you know South Africans are in a in a better state than some of their counterparts. Like I tell some of my colleagues when I travel to the UK regularly, you know they moan about gas prices more than we moan about load shedding. <laughs> <laughs> would, very true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Very, very, very true. So, we just need to, we just need to sometimes have a more positive narrative in our own minds and with our colleagues, um, because uh, other people are taking a lot more strain, even though it may not look that way from where we're sitting. Fantastic. And then Linda, from Salesforce's perspective. How is the economy affecting your business at all? I, it's been very positive so around so so far. Maybe you can uh, continue that trend. Are you guys seeing a sort of resilience from the local market? Are you seeing South African businesses rise to the challenge of a, a, a really really difficult economy and socio economic condition? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to tag on a little to what Colin's saying there. Um, you know, I think South Africans are just so resilient and so innovative. Um, and certainly, yeah, uh, our, our currency, it doesn't often run in our favor. Um, and so, yeah, that's a challenge that everyone has to overcome. But I've really been kind of buoyant about the fact that South African businesses, when you compare us, and, and we recently had uh, a South African business take the global stage at our our Dreamforce event, which is our sort of premier event in San Francisco, and shoot the lights out. People were just overwhelmed with how, you know, innovative, uh, how their, their approach was to adopting the technology moving forward. So I often think that the narrative for us needs to be a little different. I think we have so much to offer on a global stage. And with that resilience and with that innovation, uh, we certainly are seeing a very positive outlook for the, the South African environment and certainly Africa as a whole. Um, so all round, I think there's a lot of positivity there. We're certainly seeing business growth. We're seeing really new and innovative products coming um, up. There's a lot of, of people that are sort of learning from global footprints and bringing that knowledge back to South Africa, innovating in an African way and really starting some really exciting businesses. So, you know, I wouldn't be one to say it's all negative. Um, we certainly see South Africans are really resilient and innovative. That's fantastic. I was not expecting this this question to go so well and have such a positive uh, positive response. I'll be honest, um, but it, it's really great to hear uh, from all three of you that there is some positivity and there is some hope and solutions to what we're facing around the world. Um, I think we have just about run out of time. So I'm going to take this opportunity to just let our listeners know that you can find links to uh, Veeam, Zero, and Salesforce uh, right below this podcast, as always. Um, we've also got some uh, some reading material for you to go through. But I want to also just take some time to thank our guests, uh, to Linda, Colin, and Michael. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to chat to us. Um, it's been a really insightful conversation and oddly a really positive one as well. Uh, generally, when you talk about business, it's, it's a bit dreary and and ho-hum but this was really really positive so i just want to thank you so so much for sharing your insight and a bit of positivity for this week as we move into 2024 so thank you so so much all of you thanks for having me yeah, thanks so much Brent. yeah thank you